I'm John Ramos in Novato, where a local research institute has become a major player in the effort to halt and possibly even reverse the human aging process. The Buck Institute opened in 1999 as the world's only research institute singularly focused on the biology of aging. It will soon embark on a $70 million collaborative journey with the Berkeley-based Estera Institute to try to discover the biological causes of aging. The Buck's CEO, Dr. Eric Verdon, shared his vision for the Institute and its mission to redefine the limits of the human lifespan. The Buck Institute has been in business for 20 years and we, there's such a thing as being a little bit ahead of your time, but, uh, and this is where we were for a big part of that, but it seems that um, we've entered a new age in terms of aging biology. And, um, and I think the, the funding, the, the support is really reflecting the fact that a lot of progress has been made and also a realization that there are really unique opportunities to, 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 to be realized. The science has matured to a point where it is, it is ready to be deployed in humans. So, you know, basic research typically precedes um, the translation into humans by about 20 years, and that's, that's the time lag that we're looking at. The second aspect is the fact that we have a rapidly aging population, and, uh, and this has been accelerating. Um, uh, for the first time this year, we have more people above 65 than under five year, years old. So that really means the population is slowly shifting, be, becoming older. And, and, and with this uh, shift in population, there's an increasing demand for product, understanding, and really tackling the problem of aging. Over the last 150 years, our lifespan has increased by two years every decade, which means 1850, we were living on average 38. Today, we live to 78 to 80. So a remarkable increase in lifespan, almost doubling over 150 years. The problem is that even though we live longer, the quality uh, of those extra years might not be what most people would desire. And in fact, you know, most people, when they reach 65, develop one of what we call the chronic disease of aging. So that means a degradation of the quality of life. It also means an incredible and, and rapidly increasing cost for society. And so those two elements is really what has placed a added urgency on the idea we need to understand aging, we need to start tackling it as a, as a medical problem, and, and really change the, the equation of what people are thinking about get, what getting old means, which means you know, more productive, more healthy, at the end more happy. The primary goal right now is really to increase what we call the health span. So we have two variables, the lifespan, which is how many years you live, and the health span, which is how many of these years are actually healthy. For most of us, the health span is about 65. That means the last 15 years of our life we spent afflicted by these conditions, the chronic disease of aging that you and, and I are familiar with. This is cancer, many forms of cancer, neurodegeneration, that's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, uh, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, hip fractures, loss of hearing, all of these manifestations of accelerated aging that we, we accept as being part of normal aging. Well, we know some humans actually age much better than others. And typically, the centenarian not only live much longer, but they have a, a very compressed period of morbidity, of, of sickness. And so they live to 100, and in, instead of spending 15 years of their life Effect, affected by these conditions, they spend about five years. Our goal is to transform everyone in, into a centenarian so that everyone could live to 90, 95 in good health. And of course, we, we're still going to die. We're not talking about immortality or, you know, things like this. We're talking about really quality of life, healthy years of life. And I believe that today, if we were to deploy everything that we know, most people could reach 90 to 95 in good health. Um, and, and we see pockets where this actually happens, uh, including in Marin. Our life expectancy is 87 versus 78 in the rest of the country. So there's, there's a lot of hope and a lot of excitement that uh, we're on the verge of, of really changing the way, the way we will age and, and the perception of how we will age. We know how to do things in animal models in the laboratory that are quite extra extraordinary now. So we can really increase lifespan by up to 50% with drugs in animals. And, you know, this has led uh, me and many of my colleagues to be incredibly 
optimistic about it, the idea that we're going to be able to do something similar in humans. But once you enter the realm of, of medicine and, and giving drugs or interventions to humans, there is also all the risk of, of making people sick or making them live shorter. So, and the barrier to introducing these interventions in humans is, of course, much higher because we're supposed to do something that's not going to hurt people first. So, and this is where the field is. Yeah. You know, some people are a little more optimistic than others. Uh, all of us incredibly enthusiastic about what we're doing in the laboratory and seeing maybe this is a, a vision of the future of what we will be able to do in humans. You know, one thing that is important to know is science and biology is accelerating. Um, you know, if you think about the first computers were built in 1950, and the first computer was the size of this room, it's huge. And, and it took 20 years to build supercomputers. Now we all walk around with a supercomputer in our pocket. Uh, so just take this, this type of scaling and acceleration of technology and bring it to human biology. This is why I think many of us are so excited about what, what lies ahead. But, you know, we will see. There might be difficulties along the way. For example, right now, lifespan in the last two years has decreased because of COVID-19. So there will, of course, be other issues that we cannot anticipate. But the biology is robust. The biology is exciting. And at the Buck Institute here, I think we're, we're you know, leading the way in, in this. But I think will be a revolution in the way we, we, we think about healthcare, we think about aging and, and medicine. Many of our scientists were doing uh, aging research before it was cool or exciting. So in some way, you know, they've built a collective knowledge and expertise in this field, which is unequaled in the world. And I think people recognize this after a while. You know, you might be ignored for a while, people thinking you're too far out, but eventually when your predictions, which, by the way, we've been making for, for the last 20 years, turn out to be right. So the buck was responsible for this concept of geroscience, this, the idea that um, Aging is a major risk factor for all of these diseases that we talked about earlier. And that if you tackle aging, you tackle all of these diseases together. And so we're recognized as the, the leader in this field. And, you know, when people want to invest their hard-earned dollars to, to a place, they go to where they think the expertise is. And I think there's certainly, there are other places in the country and in the world that study aging, but none with the concentration of talent and expertise that we have here many of the crises that we are facing today, global warming and so on, in, in the world are a reflection of the fact that the population has continued to increase. And along with this increased lifespan, you know, when I was born, there were three billion humans. We are at seven or eight. And, and this is likely to continue. Uh, our, our philosophy is that uh, we cannot solve all problems. We are medical doctors and scientists, and we're focusing in on what we, what we understand and what we can try to do better. Um, a very key question to, to wonder is, you know, when do we stop? And should we have stopped when people were living 50 on average, which would have been in, in 1930? Um, I would have been dead for 14 years, <laughs> and I, I would tend to say that uh, I think we should continue. So I think, you know, prolonging life for the sake of prolonging life has no meaning, but I believe that our mission of increasing healthy years of life is really worth pursuing and let someone else deal with the other problems, pollution and so on. And I'm, I'm, I'm a, a techno-optimist. I, I, I really believe in the human ingenuity and I believe we will solve these problems the way we've solved many other problems before. Uh, hopefully before it's too late, especially in terms of global warming. But So our focus here is really to focus on what we know how to do which is to continue progressively increasing human lifespan and healthy years of life. One thing I do not believe in is that there's going to be a rapid acceleration of human lifespan. Uh, if we were to continue to be able to do what we've done for the last 150 years, 150 years from now, we will all live to 110. Uh, that would not be so bad already. And so imagine this is 150 years during which there will be adaptation, there will be other changes, uh, new technologies to deal with pollutions and other, other issues related to human overpopulation. I, I, I want to give you an analogy. Uh, we all know about Newton, who studied the apple falling from the tree. What people don't realize is that Newton was not the first one to see the apple falling from the tree. 
everybody knew apples fell from trees. This is from the, the age of two or three years old, you, you realize apple fall from, apples fall from trees. His genius was not to see that, it was to actually ask why. Why does it fall from the trees? Out of this, he derived the idea that it had to be a force, which turned out to be gravity. And from there, he was able to build a whole vision of the universe that had eluded people before. And, and the same goes for aging and disease. Everyone knows if you get old, you get sick. What is not what we're asking, and which I think is the exciting part of our mission, is why is the aging process leading to specific disease, to all of these diseases? And the hope is that by understanding what's underneath the aging process, the, me the molecular mechanism, you can now identify the major risk factor for all of these diseases. Instead of treating them individually as they occur, you actually are getting to the root core of the problem and really solving or at least slowing down dramatically all of these diseases. And we can do this in animal models. The question is now, can we transfer all this technology and this knowledge to humans? I wouldn't be working here if, if I wasn't sure that this is going to happen. And what you're seeing in terms of funding that's pouring in right now into the back and to the field is a reflection of the people that we talk to and show the data are becoming convinced as well. They realize, wow, this is, this is amazing what we can do in animal models. And I cannot think of any reason why this could not be transferred to, to humans. Every, most of biomedical research is based on studying animals first and then going into humans. We're right at that transition. And while there may, bump, there may be bumps along the road of getting there, uh, I, I'm, I'm ready to bet anything that 20 years from now, when we look back, we said, you know, we were really on the cusp of something that was fantastic and, and exciting.